I'm Marjorie Mead, Interim Director of the Marion E. Wade Center, and I'm very delighted to have each one of you here in this warm auditorium on this cold night, so thank you for coming out. Um, you, will, you have a, a delight in store for you tonight, I know. Uh, this is our second Hansen Lecture for this academic year. The Hansen Lectureship was named in the honor of former college trustee Ken Hansen and his wife Jean. And it was launched a little over two years ago by Wheaton College President Philip Riken, who spoke on the Messiah comes to Middle Earth, images of Christ's threefold office in the Lord of the Rings. And President Riken's three talks have been gathered together in a single volume by InterVarsity Press Academic, and we're delighted, where's David? David McNutt, who's editor for our series and is just an amazing editor. Um, David is with us tonight, we're glad, and if you had missed the launch and you're interested in taking a look at this book or even purchasing a copy, they'll be at the front reception desk tonight. So um, it's, it's well worth your time. It's very engaging and insightful, as you can imagine, from President Riken. Uh, we're very privileged to have, to have Dr. Christine Colon, Associate Professor of English at Wheaton College, as our speaker for this year's Hanson Lectures. Um, the first lecture was just wonderful. If, once again, if you missed that, it's online. It's rec the recording. You can listen to it. Um, you will not. Um, you will. You will gain much by taking time to do that. Um, the overarching theme for this this year's series is community or chaos, searching for clues in the works of Dorothy L. Sayers. Before Dr. Clone comes to speak to us on specifically tonight on Dorothy L. Sayers' vision for communities of faith. It is a special pleasure to invite Dr. Walter Hansen, who's been involved with the Wade Center since its inception, is a member of our board. He will open our evening in prayer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hansen. Thank you, Marge. Marge asked me to uh, lead in prayer in the first uh, lecture that Phil Riken gave. I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And then in the second lecture, she said, would you lead in prayer again? I said, well, I'm sure there's other people who can pray. Uh, but I gave in. And now this is the eighth time I'm doing it. So <laughs> I guess it's a kind of tradition. Uh, and I enjoy it. I especially enjoy it because I love to come and listen to the lectures and be uh, participating uh, in them. But I also enjoy it because it gives me a little excuse to try out some of my favorite quotes uh, from these authors, these authors I love so much. Uh, and so here's a quote from Dorothy Sayers, her book, uh, Creed or Chaos. And I thought it tied into the lecture tonight because she is, uh, as the great writer she is, uh, talking about the way in which uh, people view the creeds uh, as being dull and boring. Uh, well, they're nothing of the kind, so she revitalizes them by telling them in dramatic form and bringing us to the foot of the cross, which is the beginning of the community of faith, and doing it in such dramatic way that I thought it would link in with the theater man here as well. So that's my tie-in, but it's a, it's a wonderful way to re-listen to the quote, to the creed. <clears throat> here, we had a man of divine character walking and talking among us, and what did we find to do with him? The common people indeed heard him gladly. But our leading authorities in church and state considered that he had talked too much and uttered too many disconcerting truths. So we bribed one of his friends to hand him over quietly to the police, and we tried him on a rather vague charge of creating a disturbance and had him flogged and hanged on the common gallows, thanking God we were rid of a knave. All this was not very credible to us, even if he was, as many people thought and think, only a harmless, crazy preacher. But if the church is right about him, it was more discreditable still, for the man we hanged was God Almighty. So that is the outline of the official story, the tale of the time when God was the underdog and got beaten, when he submitted to the conditions he had laid down and became a man like the men he had made, and the men he had made broke him and killed him, this is the dogma we find so dull, the terrifying drama of which God is the victim and the hero. We gather as a community of faith at the foot of the cross and recognize that we are 
complicit. And we thank you that you, almighty God, are the victim and the hero, the one who came within the drama you wrote and planned to be the one to redeem us. We thank you for this evening, for the gift of those who can bring this, our faith, to new life, for Dorothy Sayers, for Christine and Andy as they expound her writings to us. We come in faith, <coughs> hungry, eager to learn and grow in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> thank you, Alter, and um, thank you all for coming out. It ended up being rather frigid tonight, so thank you for braving the cold. In 1936, Dorothy L. Sayers was asked to write a play for the Canterbury Festival. As she considered the subject she might explore, Sayers was drawn to the story of William of Sons, the architect who was commissioned to rebuild a section of Canterbury Cathedral after a devastating fire in 1174. Throughout the play, which Sayers entitled The Zeal of Thy House, she focuses on William as a master <coughs> craftsman and emphasizes the detailed work in rebuilding the cathedral. In particular, she focuses on the process of building the arches. Early in the play, William asks Hubert, his superintendent, how about that new arch? Do you think she's settled in? I'd like to get those supports out today. These questions then provoke a discussion about the beauties of a perfectly constructed arch. Hubert begins by reflecting on the words of a former mentor. The arch is the secret of the building. We ain't half learned yet what the arch can carry when it's put to it. He then concludes with his own thoughts. That's the way to build, each stone carrying his neighbor's, his neighbor's burden. William affirms Hubert's ideas, remarking, a triumph of balance, eh, Hubert? A delicate adjustment of interlocking stresses. To help us visualize what William and Hubert are describing, let's watch a brief video that shows us the process of building an arch. Now, as you watch, Think about the ways that Sayers has her characters describe the structure of an arch. It is a delicate adjustment of interlocking stresses. It allows each stone to carry his neighbor's burden. And ultimately, it is a triumph of balance. to say I was very thankful for these two gentlemen who <laughs> nicely did that for me. <laughs> so as you will have noticed from the video, not only is each stone carefully placed to withstand the stresses of the others, but also this triumph of balance is ultimately held together by the capstone or keystone. This stone, which is the final stone to be placed in the arch, is the one that locks all of the others together and enables them to stand. As we'll soon see, an arch plays an important role in the plot of the zeal of thy house. But in addition to that, I believe it serves as a powerful symbol of Sayers developing ideas about the components ne needed to maintain healthy communities of faith. First, committed individuals who are willing to participate in the work of bearing one another's burdens, like the stones in an arch, and second, a centering doctrine that acts like a keystone to hold those individuals together. Tonight, I'd like to explore how those two ideas circulate throughout Sayer's religious plays as she grapples with the various challenges that threaten to weaken the stability of the church and destroy its influence on society. Now, for those of you who were here for my first talk, you'll remember I discussed the ways that Sayer's ideas about communities of action developed over the course of her detective novels, as she began to focus on the importance of individuals developing their own particular skills 
and then joining with others in community so that those skills could be used together to help combat the evils of the world. I also suggested that with the development of her detective novel, Sayer set the stage for her la later theological works in which she addresses the challenges of helping her society recover after the ravages of World War II. With her career as a religious playwright, which she transitioned to in the late 1930s, just before the outbreak of the war, Sayers explores the complexities of her community even more deeply, as she focuses particularly on Christian community. With these plays, she presents a number of difficulties that communities of faith have as they attempt to be communities of action. And she reveals the components that she believes will help them be more effective. Significantly, it is at this point in her life that Sayers herself is initiated into a new community, the world of theater, which I believe opened her eyes even more fully to the power of individuals coming together to work toward a common goal. Through the experiences of creating and presenting her religious dramas, Sayers solidified her ideas about the key elements that are necessary to preserve communities of faith and allow them to be centers of action. And interestingly, as she observes her own society, she finds that the best model for this type of healthy community is not in the contemporary church, but rather in the theatrical communities that she worked with to create her plays. Before looking at how Sayers crafts these necessary elements for communities of faith in her plays, however, we must first see how Sayers describes the problems that have contributed to the breakdown of these communities in the first place. With the outbreak of World War II, Sayers, along with many Christian intellectuals, began to reflect on the ways that the supposedly Christian society of Great Britain might not be prepared for the challenges of the war. In Creed or Chaos, which was delivered as a lecture in 1940, Sayers characterizes the war as a life and death struggle between Christian and pagan. And she declares, at bottom, it is a violent and irreconcilable quarrel about the nature of God and the nature of man and the ultimate nature of the universe. Sayers believes that what is terrifying and tremendous about the war is that it is based not on a failure of Germany to live up to her own standards of right conduct, but rather that what we believe to be evil, Germany believes to be good. For Sayers, the fundamental issue at stake in the war is the truth of Christianity. She is therefore adamant that those who claim to be Christians must be fully grounded in the doctrines that they supposedly believe. Sayers, in fact, implies that unless the people of Britain truly understand Christian doctrine, they run the risk of winning the battle against Germany, but losing the war against the Christian faith. For Sayers, this danger is a very, is a very real one. Not only does she believe that not one person in a hundred has the faintest notion what the church teaches about God or man or society or the person of Jesus Christ, but she also worries that even devout Christians who should know better are ignoring the importance of doctrine in a mistaken belief that it makes Christianity unappealing. She imagines them exclaiming, away with the tedious complexities of dogma. Let us have the simple spirit of worship, just worship, no matter of what. Essentially, Sayers characterizes the Christians of Britain as trying to maintain the arch of Christian community without the keystone of doctrine. And throughout her work, she repeatedly demonstrates how ridiculous that is. In her essay, The Dogma is the Drama, for instance, Sayers crafts an imaginary catechism that illustrates what Christians actually seem to believe. Question, what does the church think of God the Father? Answer. He is omnipotent and holy. He created the world and imposed on man conditions impossible of fulfillment. He's very angry if these are not carried out. He likes to be truckled to and is always, always ready to pounce on anybody who trips over a difficulty in the law or is having a bit of fun. He's rather like a dictator, only larger and more arbitrary. <laughs> Question, what is the doctrine of the Trinity? The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the whole thing incomprehensible. <laughs> It's something put in by theologians to make it more difficult. It's got nothing to do with daily life or ethics. As Sayers reveals with the answer to the question about the Trinity, she worries that to most people, theology has nothing to do with real life. And she responds in Creed or Chaos exclaiming, but if Christian dogma is irrelevant to life, to what in heaven's name is it relevant? Since religious dogma is in fact nothing but a statement of doctrines concerning the nature of life and the universe. Throughout her essays, Sayers attempts to warn her readers that unless they hold to the truth of doctrine as the keystone of Christianity, the arch of their faith 
cannot stand. Sayers, however, recognizes that a lack of doctrinal understanding is not the only threat that Christians must address. For she also focuses on the difficulties Christians experience when trying to live out their faith together in community. In an essay discussing, discussing the power of evil, Sayers focuses on the way that evil continually causes division. She declares, evil can only work its will by seizing upon some good thing and giving it an ugly and destructive twist. And the good thing which it distorts to its own end is that variety and difference which is found in all created beings. Difference, though it implies limitation, is not evil. It only becomes an occasion of evil when a proud and envious will distorts it into division and hatred. Using examples of marital strife and racial prejudice, Sayers shows how easy it is to pervert the differences that should draw us together in community. For rather than recognizing the value of various perspectives and gifts and utilizing them toward a common goal, we all too often use them as reasons to isolate ourselves and hate others. To return to the image of the arch, the challenges for communities then um, are not simply, the challenge is not simply the lack of a keystone, but also the internal divisions that reveal the stone's flaws that would compromise the arch's stability even with the keystone in place. Throughout her essays, Sayers repeatedly highlights de these dangers that she believes threaten to destroy Christian community. But as we will see, it is truly in her religious plays that she fully explores the implications of the, these ideas about doctrine, evil, and community. As she presents the various challenges of individuals attempting and repeatedly failing, to live well in their communities of faith. To explore those challenges, I'd like to begin by looking at the ways that Sayers crafts community in her plays The Zeal of Thy House and The Emperor Constantine. For here we can see even more clearly how easily evil may pervert good and affect the stability of an entire community. As I mentioned earlier, The Zeal of Thy House, which was produced in 1937, is about the rebuilding of Canterbury Cathedral. Sayer centers the story on William of Sons, the architect, which allows her to explore not only the value of good work as an offering to God, but also the dangers of pride, for William comes to believe that he is indispensable to the work and must learn to submit his will to God's when he is injured in an accident. <coughs> William's sin, however, is only part of the problem, for Sayers positions him within a religious community where unity is continually threatened by internal divisions. Sayers highlights these divisions from the beginning, for the audience's first glimpse of the religious community at Canterbury Cathedral comes during a contentious meeting, as the brothers struggle to choose an architect for the rebuilding of the cathedral. With the heated debate that ensues, Sayers establishes the differences among them that could easily develop into serious problems. Brother Ernolfus advocates for the stability of an older candidate, while Brother Hillary wants a younger, more progressive man. Brother Theodotus supports a grand design, repeatedly reminding everyone that since the cathedral is an offering to God, God will provide the money. But Brother Stephen, the treasurer, is afraid of extravagant costs. <laughs> and Brother Ambrose, the choir master, simply wants good acoustics. <laughs> None of these differences is necessarily sinful in itself, but they all have the potential to develop into sin because of what they reveal about the brothers' mixed motives and the developing rivalries. As Sayers reveals throughout the rest of the play, the tensions established in this opening scene and the rivalries that are revealed even more clearly once William is chosen as the architect repeatedly threaten the peace of this community. Brother Gervais expresses the problem late in the play when he declares, jealousy, vanity, hatred, malice, and all uncharitableness. And these are churchmen vowed to holy obedience and humility. The most substantial controversy within the community revolves around the question of whether William's lack of virtue in his personal life taints the work on the cathedral, for he is brazenly carrying on an affair with Lady Ursula. While Brother Gervais admires William's work, <coughs> declaring, he thinks of nothing, lives for nothing, but the integrity of his work, Brother Theodotus asserts that he would rather have a worse-built church with a more virtuous builder. William is living a sinful life, um, which as the prior warns him may ultimately have an effect on the work as the workmen waste their time in gossip and backbiting. But Theodotus is also sinning in his self-righteous condemnation of William, a point that the prior also calls attention to in his recommendation to Theodotus to 
do his own work and set charity as a bridle on his tongue. Rather than coming together to support each other in the great work of rebuilding the cathedral, they are divided and distracted. Ultimately, Sayers uses William's accident to emphasize the serious consequences of these divisions as they develop into sin. For when the sins of each individual come together, they have powerful ramifications, not only for William, but also for the rest of the community. As William prepares to ascend to the top of the great arch to set the keystone, he asks Theodotus and Simon to carefully check the rope that will help carry him to the top of the arch. William then proceeds to converse with his mistress, whom he has invited to witness his great feat, a conversation that distracts both Theodotus and Simon from their job. The prurient Simon stares at William and Ursula and sings lewd songs as he imagines their relationship, while the scandalized Theodotus first averts his eyes from the sinful couple and then closes them as he fervently prays. Neither notices the flaw in the rope that will eventually break under the stress of supporting William. As Crystal Downing remarks in her discussion of the play, the sin is communal. William, Ursula, Simon, and Theodotus all play a part in the disastrous fall from the arch that permanently disables William and threatens to halt progress on the cathedral. Their individual sins come together to damage not only William, but also the entire community and its project. Sayers takes this idea of communal sin even further in The Emperor Constantine. In this play, which was produced in 1951 for a festival in the city of Colchester, Sayers traces the life of Constantine and explores the question of whether Constantine, or whether Christianity, excuse me, was for him a living faith, a profitable superstition, or a cynical instrument of policy. The climax of the play is the Council at Nicaea. And as Sayers explores the disputes that led to the formation of the Nicene Creed, she emphasizes the danger of individual sins that not only begin to threaten the unity of the church, but also its witness to the rest of the empire. The issue at stake is, of course, highly important to church doctrine, for the bishops are divided based on their beliefs regarding the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. It is an essential issue and must be settled. The viciousness of the arguments surrounding the controversy, however, reveal the dangerous instability that characterizes the church even apart from this confusion over doctrine. Sayers illustrates this problem in a rather humorous scene as people from all over the empire arrive at Nicaea for the council. As a number of them gather at a barber shop, they begin debating the controversy. This theological conversation, however, is interspersed with angry complaints, dirty jokes, name calling, personal insults, and a slanderous accusation against the emperor's mother. It quickly deteriorates into a brawl. And with the stage directions, Sayers emphasizes that the important question of doctrine has been lost. At this point, the police, represented by a number of soldiers, arrive on the scene, pushing through the crowd, which is now shouting impartially for Arius, Alexander, Constantine, and any other names which occur to them, or just shouting. <laughs> While Sayers makes the most of the humor of this scene, her audience, even while laughing, may remember an earlier scene where Constantine complained about how these divisions in the church were being perceived. If you would wait in patience, you would set an example of brotherly love to the whole world. But your patience is schism, riot, open denunciation, excommunicated bishops fleeing from one see to another and proclaiming their wrongs in every Christian pulpit so that the heathen laugh and the church and empire are ashamed. Not only must the church address this important doctrinal issue to establish a keystone upon which Christians will rely, but it must also address the pervasive sin within the community that makes this dispute so much worse for the church itself and so destructive to its witness to the rest of the world. Throughout these plays, Sayers reminds us that evil does its work by seizing upon some good thing and giving it an ugly and destructive twist. Productive differences among individuals that could, through honest discussion, lead to better decisions and a clearer conception of truth, often lead instead to judgmental anger, self-righteousness, and even violence. In The Seal of Thy House, Sayers develops this idea even further by showing how vulnerable everyone is to this perversion of sin, even those who have fully devoted themselves to doing the work that God has given them to do. As I discussed in my previous talk, Sayer's goal for any community is good, productive work where individuals, by committing themselves to their unique jobs, can come together to serve society. 
But with her portrayal of William of Sons, Sayers illustrates how even this ultimate good for community may be perverted. Sayers portrays William as being completely committed to the integrity of his work, even as he leads an immoral life outside of the workplace. Throughout the play, she emphasizes the important spiritual value of his commitment. This is revealed particularly through the comments of the angels who observe all of the actions that take place inside the cathedral. For when Michael mentions William's immoral life, which is crammed full of deadly sins, Gabriel counters that with William's work on the cathedral, it is all well and truly laid without a fault. Raphael agrees with Gabriel, describing William's excellent craftsmanship as a prayer of worship to the eternal architect. And this is echoed by the prior, who believes that William's excellence in his craft powerfully reveals God's glory. As a worker, William seems to fulfill his role perfectly. He is the one who sets the vision for the project and ensures that the community works together effectively to achieve this important task. And it is precisely through his excellent work that Sayers illustrates the insidious nature of sin that powerfully corrupts the best motives into the worst. William is, in fact, such a good craftsman that he begins to believe that he is not only equal to God, but also, in some ways, superior to God. And it is through this sin of pride that Sayers reveals how easily good can be perverted. When speaking with Ursula before he ascends to work on the arch, he declares, in making man, God overreached himself and gave away his Godhead. He must now depend on man for what man's brain, creative and divine, can give him. Man stands equal with him now, partner and rival. William then moves from equality to superiority, boasting, this church is mine, and none but I, not even God, can build it. Rather than placing his masterful work in subjection to God, William arrogantly decides that he is indispensable. <coughs> Sayers, however, emphasizes just how dangerous this presumption is. For even as William makes these statements, the archangel Michael is readying his sword to cut the rope when William ascends to the top of the arch. Yes, in the earthly realm, William's fall occurs because two of the workers fail to inspect the rope properly. But there is also a divine component, as Michael enacts the punishment for William's sin of pride. And Sayer's use of symbolism here is quite powerful, for William's fall occurs as he attempts to guide the keystone into place in the great arch. By depending upon his own work rather than God's, William has tried to establish himself as the keystone of the arch of this community, and he is punished by God for that presumption. Sayers, however, does not leave the story here, for she offers William a chance to repent, and it was, is with this process of repentance that Sayers continues to illustrate how insidious sin may be as it transforms good into evil and perverts the work of the community. For William has difficulty even recognizing the sin for which he has been punished. After the accident, William attempts to control the work in the cathedral from his sickbed, but he finds himself continually hindered by extreme pain. In his frustration, he confesses his sins to the prior, but even after the prior absolves him, he still can't rest. While he has confessed his lust, greed, wrath, and avarice, he has not yet recognized his sin of pride, the sin that is so much a part of him that he didn't realize it was sin. Even when he's confronted by the Archangel Michael, William still clings desperately to his pride in his work. He comes to recognize his sin only when Michael reminds him that through Christ's death and ascension, Christ, the master architect, left the work to others. Only then does William acknowledge his sin of pride and agree to let others finish his own work, asking that the church will not be lost through him. William finally comes to recognize his individual sin as well as the terrible ramifications it might have on the church community. And he asks for God in his mercy, not only to forgive him, but also to preserve the community, which has been damaged by his sin. With these portrayals of sin in the zeal of thy house, as well as in the Emperor Constantine, Sayers emphasizes the intense difficulties involved in preserving communities of faith. For not only is their unity threatened by the conflict that inevitably rises when, arises when differences are perverted by sin, but also their ultimate purpose of action may be threatened as individuals begin to serve themselves rather than God. The situations in both of these plays seem rather bleak. If good is so easily perverted into evil, 
how can inevitably flawed communities of faith ever come together? In the seal of thy house, however, Sayers presents a powerful moment of hope. For as the prior talks about all that William has been able to achieve despite his deep flaws, he declares, for God founded his church, not upon John, the loved disciple that lay so close to his art and knew his mind, not upon John, but Peter, Peter the liar, Peter the coward, Peter the rock, the common man. John was all gold and gold is rare. The work might wait while God ransacked the corners of the earth to find another John. But Peter is the stone whereof the world is made. That hope of God working through the flawed individuals that form his church is also displayed in these two plays. Not only does Sayers state it directly through Prior's words in The Zeal of Thy House, but she also explores it more fully in The Emperor Constantine. As the church community in this play comes together both to find the truth that will anchor their faith and to care for each other's souls, thereby helping to restore what sin had seemingly destroyed. In The Emperor Constantine, Sayers illustrates that in the midst of all of the dissension, the bishops do eventually manage to work through the challenges of each phrase of the Nicene Creed and arrive at a powerful, clear statement of doctrine, a keystone that anchors the faith that we believe in a savior who is begotten, not made, consubstantial of one being with the Father. And significantly, this creed is developed through community as the bishops wrestle with the implications of every word. Alexander explains to Constantine how this will work. Neither you nor we, Augustus, can dictate to the Holy Ghost. The decision will not rest with Arius, nor with me, no, nor with the emperor of the world, but with the lovers of Christ gathered from every land. Our little wisdoms are not alone, being compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses and supported by the prayers of the saints. With the power of the Holy Spirit and the support of prayer, communities of faith may utilize their differences appropriately to ultimately arrive at truth. These communities may also come together in powerful acts of love and honesty to help bring individuals to repentance and faith. While the climax of the Emperor Constantine is the creation of the Nicene Creed, Sayer's overarching story focuses on Constantine's gradually developing faith. For while he quickly sees the political value of allying himself with Christianity, he refrains from being baptized until right before his death. Constantine, however, is surrounded by Christians who help guide him to his final decision of faith. As Crystal Downing remarks, Sayers shows not only the communal writing of dogma, but also the communal performance of Constantine's faith. In particular, Sayers illustrates how Constantine's mother, Helena, and his secretary, Toby, provide the love and guidance that he needs at key moments in his life. Sayers uses the most powerfully to help Constantine grapple with the weight of his sin when he murders his son Crispus, mistakenly thinking that Crispus has slept, has slept with Constantine's wife. After discovering his mistake, Constantine begins to rave blasphemously to Toby. I am the Lord of the world, like God. I had a son, like God. And like God's son, he was innocent, and I killed him, just like God. All those solemn old graybeards in Nicaea wrangling about God's son with me sitting there on my golden throne. And none of them knew that I was going to sacrifice my beloved son and be turned into very God. At this point of crisis, Constantine perversely exalts himself in his sin rather than turning to God in repentance. And Sayers uses Togi to remind Constantine not only of the truth of his sin, but also of the forgiveness offered by God. Toby first brings Constantine back to reality, declaring, you're a common sinner like the rest of us, do you hear? An ordinary, stupid, headstrong man with a violent temper who has committed a common murder. It's actually one of my favorite points in the play. <laughs> the bluntness of that is great. Then, however, he reminds Constantine where his hope needs to lie, stating, we are all guilty of Christ's death and all redeemed by his blood. Togi risks, risks, risks his own life with these blunt remarks, but he does so to help bring Constantine to repentance and salvation. And while Constantine at this point still cannot completely accept this hope of salvation, he does begin to have a clearer conception of sin, which he later expresses to his mother, declaring, it is a corruption of life at its source. I and mine are so knit together that no, 
is so knit together in evil that no one can tell where the guilt begins or ends. And it is this point, at this point, that Helena provides the additional support that he needs. For when Constantine cries out, mother, tell me whose blood is on my hands, she echoes Toby's earlier wisdom, declaring, the blood of God, which makes intercession for us, reminding him again of the truth that he has yet to accept. Constantine's conversion is a long process that isn't complete until his baptism right before his death. But as Sayers represents it, Helena and Toby provide the essential guidance he needs to finally accept the truth of Christianity. With the Emperor Constantine, Sayers reveals the hope that despite their flaws, communities may come together not only to affirm truth, but also to help bring others to faith. As she continually demonstrates, however, that help must be founded on God and not simply on human work. While sin continually perverts good into evil, God is the one who, as Sayers states in her essay, The Triumph of Easter, takes our sins and errors and turns them into victories, just as he made the crime of the crucifixion to be the salvation of the world. Sayers represents this most clearly in her play, The Just Vengeance. In this play, which was produced in 1946 for a festival commemorating the 750th anniversary of Litchfield Cathedral, Sayers crafts the story of an airman who, upon being shot down during the war, is confronted with the realities of what he truly believes. As Sayers describes it, in that moment, his spirit finds itself drawn into the fellowship of his native city of Litchfield. There, being shown an image, uh, in an image the meaning of the atonement, he accepts the cross and passes in that act of choice from the image to the reality. With this play, Sayers focuses on the power of the atonement, both to reconcile humanity to God and to bring individuals into community with each other as they share each other's burdens. In this play, which was heavily influenced by both Dante and Charles Williams, Sayers illustrates the utter brokenness of humanity by emphasizing the truth that without Christ, we can never escape the evil of sin, no matter how innocent we would like to see ourselves. Early in the play, the, the airman recites <coughs> his personal creed. He believes in man and in the hope of the future, the steady growth of knowledge and power over things, the equality of all laboring for the community, and a just world where everyone will be happy. The airman is frustrated that humanity has not yet achieved a just society. And while he recognizes the challenges of determining guilt and innocence, particularly with, with regards to his actions in the war, he refuses to accept his own complicity in the shared guilt of sin that makes this type of justice impossible. He instead attempts to escape the guilt that he feels over his actions in the war by blaming others, crying, it's not my fault but the faults of the old people. The airman desperately asserts his innocence and his desire for justice until he eventually realizes that he too will be judged and found guilty by the next generation. With this opening of her play, Sayers reveals why the airman's vision of justice will never be achieved, for he begins to realize the impossibility of humans ever establishing a foundation of true innocence from which to enact it. Significantly, Sayers has this realization occur within the context of community. As the recording angel of the city tells him, the airman has been drawn back to his home in this moment of death because it is for him a God-bearing image that has the potential to draw him to the truth of Christ. This idea, which Sayers borrows from Dante, is the core of the play. For the airman must allow his love for the city to draw him back not only into its community, but more importantly, into the community of the church. As the airman comes to identify himself with this community, he begins to understand even more deeply both the utter brokenness of humanity and the perfect sacrifice of Christ that provides our only hope. Sayers emphasizes this point by having the members of the city act out moments from the scriptures to help the airman fully understand the truth of humanity's guilt and Christ's atonement. The airman is initially drawn into this play within a play as the recording angel introduces him to Eve and the airman begins to pose his questions about good and evil and justice directly to her. But eventually, he becomes simply an observer as the city begins to answer his questions by presenting the tragedy of Cain and Abel and emphasizing the truth that all suffer with Abel and destroy with Cain, each one at once the victim and the avenger. 
With this retelling, the city reminds the airman that the innocence that he tries to claim for himself is impossible for anyone to achieve. For all are tainted, even in their seeming innocence. Once this truth has resonated within the airman's thoughts, the community then illustrates for him the just vengeance of Christ's perfect sacrifice, as the same chorus members who presented the story of Cain and Abel now act out Christ's birth, trial, and crucifixion, revealing that Only the soul that has never consented to sin and is not concerned to justify itself can accept the whole guilt, the open injustice and the hidden iniquity in the heart of equity. Carry them away, purge them, and sterilize them, taking them into itself and making conclusion. And it is here where the airman is drawn fully not only into the community of the city of Litchfield, but also into the community of the church, as he himself participates in the reenactment. At first, he remains in the role of a questioner, striving to understand both God's law and Christ's sacrifice by questioning Jesus directly during his trial before Caiaphas. But then, the airman surprises himself as he cries, crucify, crucify, along with the crowd, becoming complicit in the sin that he has been trying to escape. Finally, he comes to recognize the truth that only Jesus as both God and man can provide the perfect sacrifice to atone for humanity. And he decides to enter into that truth by helping to carry the cross. At the climax of the play, when Jesus begins to carry his cross on the way to the crucifixion, the recording angel asks, who will carry the cross and share the burden of God? The members of the chorus and the airman himself all rush to help creating a powerful image as these individuals come together as the church, both to accept the work of the atonement and to respond to it by bearing each other's burdens. Interestingly, when the play was first performed at Litchfield Cathedral, the dean of the cathedral questioned the staging of this scene, worrying that the sight of people helping Jesus carry his cross up and down the aisles of the cathedral might not be reverent enough. Sayers responded forcefully, declaring, the carrying of the cross by the faithful is the point of the play. It is the play. For Sayers, this moment of the play powerfully illustrates the two components that she believes are essential to our understanding of the atonement. <clears throat> that the act not only reconciles individuals to God, but also unites all of us to each other. By taking up the cross, the members of this community are physically enacting their choice to follow Christ and accept his sacrifice for their sins. And they are also demonstrating their willingness to carry the burdens of others in their community. As the various individuals run to take up the cross, they each declare a different burden, such as shame, toil, pain, or bitterness that they are willing to carry. A burden that correlates directly to ways that they themselves have been injured by others. As Suzanne Bray describes it, for Sayers, this carrying of the guilt by Christ is the way that he makes evil good in and through the working of the law of sin. It is also the prototype of the way that Christians, as part of Christ's body, can play their part in the work of transforming evil into good on a daily basis through acts which both follow and complement the forgiveness of sins. For Sayers, this vision of the atonement provides first the keystone a Christ's perfect sacrifice that stabilizes the arch of the church, and then second, a model for the way that individual Christians may actually bear the burdens of each other as they fulfill their roles as, as stones within that arch. While, as we've seen, these ideas are embedded throughout these three plays, Sayers reveals them most completely in The Just Vengeance through this powerful moment where the airman joins all the other flawed and broken members of the church as they run to help carry the cross. Sayers discusses many of these ideas about Christian community in her essays, but it is truly in The Just Vengeance, The Emperor Constantine, and The Zeal of Thy House that she reveals their complexities and provides the powerful images that help her audiences understand them. And I believe it's significant that Sayers expresses these ideas most fully through drama. For as Sayers began to learn more about the craft of theater and the, way that theater and the ways that theater professionals come together to produce a play, she began to see theater as a much better example of a successful community of faith than the contemporary church. When Sayers began writing for the theater, she knew that she had a lot to learn. 
While she had the enthusiasm of an amateur stemming from her childhood love of theatricals, she did not have any professional experience. She therefore relied heavily on professionals to integrate her effectively into their community. With the Zealify House, for instance, she turned for help to her experienced production team. Parcourt Williams, a well-known actor who had been the artistic director of the Old Vic Theatre in London, Frank Napier, an actor and director from the Old Vic, Elizabeth Haffenden, a well-known costume designer, designer who would later win Academy Awards for her designs for Ben-Hur and A Man for All Seasons, and Lawrence Irving, a set designer who had been working in Hollywood. Her letters to them are full of requests for help as she seeks to master this new medium. And she is, perhaps surprisingly, remarkably humble regarding her place within this new community. Generally, when Sayers discusses the craft of writing, she presents herself as the ultimate expert. She knows her job and does it well, and woe to anyone who questions that. <laughs> as a playwright, however, Sayers is generally more humble and generous. She recognizes that she plays only a part in the success of the final production, and she's willing to take the advice of experts, even when it comes to how she crafts the play. In a letter to Irving, for instance, she defers to his opinion, remarking, having, as a dramatist, become enamored of my own work, I'm inclined to urge the cutting down of the pageant rather than of the four acts of the play proper, but you will use your own judgment about this. In addition, Sayers resists the inclination to dictate every element of production with copious stage directions. She leaves it to the experts to interpret the play effectively from the foundation that she has laid for them. When writing The Just Vengeance, for instance, Sayers describes her play as a working playwright script containing nothing but straightforward directions to a producer who will know how to interpret them. And she warns that if a playwright tries to prescribe every movement and every tone of voice, he merely gets in the way of the actors and hampers the production. In a poem to Harcourt Williams, she even describes her play as dull, deaf, senseless ink and paper until it receives life through an actual production. As a novelist, Sayers describes the powerful ways that individuals could come together in community and use their skills to help transform society. But as a playwright, she experienced that kind of power for herself. She recognized that everyone in the production must first be unified with the common truth, the success of the play, and then must be committed not only to doing their own excellent work individually, but also to supporting the rest of the community with their expertise. Only with that kind of focus, passion, and humility would the final goal be achieved. The powerful significance for this, of this for Sayers is revealed in a talk that she delivered at the Malvern Conference in 1941, when she was invited to speak on the church's witness in society. When thinking about the powerful uni unifying bond that should exist among Christians, she asks a series of questions. Do I immediately feel at home with Christians of any class or nationality, more at home with them than with non-Christians of my own nation and class? Should I, in a casual encounter of a few hours, find the Christians unhesitatingly discovering one another and plunged into animated discussion of their common interests and experiences? Am I sure that they are organized by a discipline which, overriding all conflicting considerations, will, when a crisis occurs, make them toe the line as one man? Do I feel that tiresome, stupid, selfish, quarrelsome, pig-headed, and infuriating as they may be, as they may individually be, I would rather be associated with them in the most laborious and painful devotion to our common ends than with any other set of people on earth in any other pursuit imaginable. Sayers then confesses that she must answer no to these questions. And she is struck by the fact that she has found that kind of community, not in the church, but in the theater. She declares, I know that if their stomachs are aching, their parents dying, their wives deserting them, and the whole company quarreling like cats, a rigid discipline will find them at their posts when the curtain rises. That they are conscious, even if dumbly and vaguely, of a tremendous traditional solidarity, reaching so far back into the past as to make the Christian church look like a mushroom of a night's growth. Above all, I am conscious of that rooted loyalty to something outside themselves, which is expressed in the threadbare formula, the show must go on and which not only makes toil and fatigue and hardship and difficulty negligible, but transforms them into a kind of arduous pleasure. And because of these things, I recognize in the theater all the stigmata of a real and living 
church. Theater for Sayers has all of the qualities that she desired to see in the church. So it seems fitting that she used drama to explore the challenges facing communities of faith. With these plays, Sayers not only reflected on the qualities that communities of faith need in order to thrive, but she also enacted them with each of the communities that came together for each of her productions. Sayers may have, ex may have experienced her ideal community um, of faith much more fully in the theater than in the church, but she never abandoned her idea that the church could become a more effective community of faith. While she repeated the reveals in her plays just how difficult it is for common flawed stones to come together and form a perfect arch, she also demonstrates that by looking to Christ as our keystone to hold us together and sharing the burdens with others as we work together to support that truth, we may help preserve the arch of Christian community and serve God effectively. In addition, Sayers recognizes the powerfully transformative work of Christ through the atonement. For even if we are only common, flawed stones like Peter, she trusts that Christ, being the alchemist stone, can stern, turn stone to gold and purge the gold itself from dross till all is gold. That is Sayer's ultimate vision for communities of faith. Thank you. Christine, thank you. That had so much truth and so much strength and um, quite a call to what we need in our world today, isn't it? Um, we really look forward with great anticipation to the final and third lecture in this series that'll be on March 22nd. Um, we are delighted to have Andy Mangan, lecturer of theater and communications at Wheaton College as the faculty respondent to Christine's talk. Andy serves as both director and teacher in Arena Theater and is greatly responsible for the wonderful Shakespeare in the Park that our Wheaton community has enjoyed every August for the last five years. Please join me in welcoming Andy Mangan. Thank you. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. I'll do my best. Um, I was in this space some years ago with Marge and looking at it as it was being just finished and um, thinking about theatrical possibilities of things we might do in here. <laughs> and nothing has happened, at least for me, since then. But maybe tonight is the start of something, so be careful what you wish for, Marge. <laughs> I'd like to tell a story about Arena Theater. In 1984, Arena Theater got a new space here on campus. Jenks Hall had been purchased in that spring, and the theater was moving from the basement of Fisher Dorm. <laughs> the basement of Fisher Dorm was quite a place to do theater. Do you think Jenks Hall is hard to find? <laughs> Low ceilings, audience stacked on walls, and the story goes that during certain plays, they would bribe the dorm floor above them with pizza to not flush the toilet during the show. <laughs> Nothing ruins the tender moment of theater quite like dorm plumbing. <laughs> Jim Young, the director of the theater at the time, had been praying fervently for a new space and was excited to move in. Jim and the students in the theater carried all the set pieces, furniture, <coughs> costumes, clothing racks, and props across campus in what must have been a wild procession. Once everything had been moved out of Fisher and was, there was no object left to carry, they began to carry something else. Jim believed that the prayers of those who had worked in that basement were in the walls. The students put their hands against the walls in Fisher, and in the last leg of the procession, they carried the prayers to the new space in Jenks and put them into the walls. They literally carried the prayers from one building to the other. It's a powerful image of both prayer and community. It's a perfect story of how theater had given Jim and those students a way to embody belief and give it action. And it served to connect them to the community of the past, the present, and the future. In Arena Theater, this tradition is still in place. Each year, before we start the year, we start with a time of prayer where we put our hands into the walls of Arena Theater. We add to the prayers in there. I have learned through the practice of theater that things matter, prayers matter, 
embodiment matters. Jim Young loved the work of Dorothy Sayers. He taught her plays every year in his church and theater class. He directed The Zeal of Thy House in 1978 in that same basement. St. John's Lutheran, I'll take it back. I believe Dorothy Sayers would have loved Jim Young and that story. It is this kind of display of belief, community, and action that Sayers recognized as the stigmata of the real and living church. As Dr. Cologne has clearly laid out for us, there was something important and transformative for Sayers in the theater. Dorothy Sayers was intrigued and engaged by the community of theater makers united to the goal to put on a play. I want to go further and explore the levels of community possible in the theater, not only in the process of theater making, but also in the audience experience. It is the only art form performed by humans, for humans, about what it means to be human. Whether with I am music or iambic pentameter, the theater seeks to present and explore who we are. In order to do this, it is dependent on a series of collaborations, each requiring belief, commitment, and relationship. This call to community and away from isolation is the very thing Dr. Cologne is pointing us to in Dorothy Sayers' work. A play, unlike other written material, is unfinished until this collaboration begins. That is why, as she said in this letter, all good stage scripts read rather crudely and badly. If a player were to prescribe all these, every movement and tone of voice, it would get in the way of the actor's hand for the production. Sayers, who had primarily written novels, would be working in a different way with new material. She was engaged in this collaborative model, perhaps out of hunger for community that she sought in other areas. In 1936, beginning with the Zeal of the House, she entered into theater in a new way and saw how theater was made from the inside. In the early days of a production, a group of designers and directors will sit down and bring their visual experience and storytelling acumen to the material. Each is focused intensely on their own phase of the production, set, costumes, lights, music, but all in the shared service of the script. They must balance one another to allow the story to be clear. When I'm directing a play, I find this collaborative process to be enormously helpful. It is in these first few meetings when the play becomes clear. It gives life to the script, which is essentially dead material. And it is a very infor important first step in the collaborative process. It draws the play out of the study in which it was written and into a world where others be can begin to engage with it. Designers and directors wrestle with the play to try and tell its story to the audience, lifting it quite literally from the script to the stage. Then, a play goes into rehearsal, where it gains another important set of collaborators. Let's look at this excerpt from uh, the poem to the interpreter of Harcourt Williams. So is the play, saved by the actor's making. No play but dull, deaf, senseless ink and paper. Either for either make, light, eye, sense, spirit, ear, sound, gift, gold, play, actor, speech and knowing become themselves by what themselves inherit from their sole heirs, receiving and bestowing. Thus then do thou, taking what thou dost give, live in these lines by whom alone they live. She describes beautifully the embodiment that is necessary in the process of a character coming to life. She admired Harcourt Williams, an actor who played William in that original production of Zeal of Thy House. She's also act recognizing without the actor, the lines are dead, by extension, the characters. I'm reminded of another Jim Young story. He was teaching a Shakespeare class, and two actors, although they had memorized their lines, hadn't rehearsed their scene like they should. According to one of the actors, they believed they could stumble their way through it. Because they felt awkward and they weren't ready, they didn't take it seriously, and at times laughing at themselves during the scene. When they were finished with the scene, Jim Young put down his clipboard and left the room. The actors in the class didn't know what to do. <laughs> Jim came back a few minutes later, clear he had been crying. And he said, these characters are real. They are stuck on a page and you are their only chance to have life. An audience will never know them if you do that to them. They will never live. That is your responsibility and this is what you do. How would you like it if someone told your story like that? Apparently there wasn't a dry eye in the class. 
It's a lot to demand of a college student. <laughs> but that was Jim. <laughs> he was moved by the process of the characters coming to life. It's an almost holy act of transformation, the deepest kind of empathy. This empathy is possible through the practice of embodiment, through extended imagination, and the commitment to love the character. In justifying and advocating for a character, an actor will often discover how similar they are to that character. I have always found sound theatrical reasoning in the phrase, there but for the grace of God go I. It is out of this second collaboration, actor with character, that the play begins to come to life more deeply. Human beings come out of it, embodied and relatable. We'll explore that in a minute. But theater is dependent on a third and maybe most important phase of collaboration. Unlike film, theater is dependent on a live audience. That is not to say there's not a vital process that happens in the rehearsal hall, but all that rehearsal, all the sets and costumes, all the intense focus on every moment are all pointed towards the future audience. Theater is dependent on an audience and not a passive one. In a theater, the audience is being asked to be more than consumers. You are being asked to engage and participate. You are being asked to be co-creators of the play. Dorothy Sayers knew this was necessary for a play to work. Let me point you to the words of the recorder at the very beginning of A Just Vengeance. Playing all the parts as best we may, but yet we who are actors bid you not forget that all these images on which you look are but pictures painted in a book. No more like they that bid you think upon than this yellow disc is like the sun. Though in a picture this might stand for that, and the great sun take no offense thereat. It's not dissimilar to William Shakespeare's prologue to Henry V. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. In two a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings. It is a challenge to call and imagine. It recognizes that there will be holes and the audience has to step into the gap. As the great theater director Peter Brook describes it, the audience is there to complete the creation. Should we try it together? In this room that is not a theater yet, I'm asking you to create with me. This comes from the end of The Just Vengeance. I'm sorry, this comes from the end of <laughs> Zeal Thy House. John Ingram, senior, has agreed to play William. I will play opposite him as Michael the Angel. It is the end of the play, and William is struggling with the injuries from his fall. He has, he thinks, confessed everything to God, and he still doesn't feel peace or forgiveness. He confronts Michael and wants to know what else God wants. Answer me, angel. What have I ever done or left undone that I may not repent nor God forgive? There where thy treasure is, thy heart is also. Thy sin is in thy heart. But all my heart was in my work. Even so. What? In my work? My sin was in my work? Thou liest. Though thou speak with God's own voice, thou liest. In my work, that cannot be. I grant the work not perfect. No man's work is perfect. Doth God demand the impossible? Then blame God, not me, that I am man, not God. He hath broken me, hath sought to snatch the work out of my hand. Wherefore? Oh, now, now I begin to see. This was well spoken. He is a jealous God. The work was not ill done, t'was done too well. He will not have men creep so near his throne to steal applause from him. Is this my fault? Why, this needs no repentance and shall have none. Let God destroy me, since he has the power to slay the thing he envies. But while I have breath, my work is mine. He shall not take it from me. Thank you, John.
We talked about doing the parts the other way, but decided he was more prideful and I was more angelic. <laughs> John, by giving to William his body, breath, and imagination, has given him life. In that moment, he was William, not some character in a page, but a living, breathing human being, sharing the room with us, breathing the same air, John did a nice job of embodying that struggle that William is going through. We can see how the realizations manifest in his body in real time. And we, the audience, share in a moment because we are in the room with him. Ayad Akhtar, the playwright, described it this way in a recent essay in the New York Times. A living being before a living audience, relationship unmediated by contemporary disembodied screen. Not the appearance of a person, but the reality of one. Not a simulacrum of relationship, but the form of actual relationship. The situation of all theater. A situation that can awaken in us a recollection of something more primordial. Religious ritual. The act of gathering to witness the myths of our alleged origins enacted. This is the root of theater's timeless magic. This connection in the moment between performer and audience, the shared experience of a glimpse of humanity, demands something of you. It asks you to tell the story too. An audience, inclining and co-creating, might be able to experience some things they've never experienced in their own lives. It gives us a chance to see the embodied stories of the extremes of humanity, times we might never face. And in it, we might recognize ourselves. And very importantly, out of that last collaboration can come reflection. The great paradox of theater is this. An audience is being asked to look past themselves, to engage in a story about others with the hope of who they are will be reflected back at them. I've always loved this quote by Arthur Miller. My conception of an audience is of a public, public, each member of which is caring about him what he thinks is an anxiety or a hope or a preoccupation, which is his alone and isolates him from mankind. And in this respect, at least the function of a play is to reveal him to himself so that he may touch others by virtue of the revelation of his mutuality with them. If only for this reason I regard the theater as serious business, one that makes, or should make, man more human, which is to say, less alone. In this way, the, fight, the theater fights isolation. It allows us to see that our struggles with life and sin are not unique. They are but for the grace of God, go I. How do we fit into this arch Dr. Cologne has described until we know how we are similar? I've had this experience many times as an audience member, and I know of many more stories where people are shown something by a play. It often sneaks up on you. It's often revealed where and how you least expect it. And reflection doesn't happen in isolation either. It happens while you're sitting in a crowd. The theater is not for single viewing. It is not for private consumption. It is not on your phone. You are meant to be sitting with others, laughing when they laugh, crying when they cry. Sometimes, Moved to do so by those around you. It is what the ancient Greeks would call catharsis. Catharsis is this release of emotions caused by viewing or experiencing art. It was believed that out of catharsis could come restoration and renewal. It caused realization and change. I had the unique opportunity to be in a play based on the poems of our colleague, Brett Foster. I didn't know that would happen. <clears throat> Brett had been fighting cancer for some time. And an idea developed to theatricalize and embody his poems in a night of theater. The title is taken from one of his poems, The Future Belongs to the Good Old Days. We rehearsed for several months, collaborating with Brett on how his poems might work. He gave us new, new material he was still working on. At that point, we didn't know how it would work. But we started connecting, we started working on his work, pardon me. But we started the work connecting with the truths of life and death in his poetry. There was so much humanity in it, a way to embody. There were poems about doctors and airports and family. And as we worked towards an opening night, our friend became more ill. During our first performance, Brent went to be with the Lord. The audience that night was made up of people who knew Brent and wanted to celebrate his work. 
We didn't know how precisely we were also celebrating his life. I will never forget the faces of his friend in the, friends in the audience. I, an actor, they, the audience, were sharing in a moment that would never be repeated. Rarely is the moment this charged. And yet, this very thing is the power of theater. The shared experience, live, ephemeral, affected and changed by a live audience. A recipe for community. Dorothy Sayers clearly loved the theater. She deeply connected to the artists who worked on her plays and found in them, as Dr. Cullen has showed us, a community that's, that she saw as unique, even in comparisons to the church. On a deeper, deeper level, her plays were asking questions about what it means to be human, what it means to be redeemed. And she was able to do it because designers brought her plays off the page, characters brought her play, uh, actors brought her characters to life, and the audience is connected to the life that they saw. Unlike her novels, her characters would come to life on stage, embodied by real, living human beings, being watched by other human beings, who could watch them breathe, fight, and change. And in this way, she could draw a community into questions about who they were and how they could fit into an arch. She could ask them what their keystone would be. And as Dr. Cullen has showed us, she hoped to draw them towards each other, towards reflection, and towards action. Thank you. Thank you, Andy and John, for bringing a little piece of Arena here tonight. Um, Dorothy Sayers would have enjoyed it and valued it, and Jim Young would have been very proud of it. Jim was a good friend, as was Brett, and this is. Anyway, thank you for reminding us. Thank you. And for bringing to life so much of what Christine shared together. Um, this has been a very, very special evening, and there's more to come. Give us one quick minute, and we are going to set up the stools up here, and you'll have a chance to ask some questions of these two gifted people who know Dorothy Sayers well. So thank you. Thank you very much. When can we expect a production of one of uh, Dorothy Sayers' <laughs> plays at the arena? I knew that was coming. <laughs> um, I don't know. They're, I think they're very, most of them are very difficult plays to produce. Um, as a production uh, manager, my job is to sort of see it from that perspective. And I, you know, you see these plays with 90 actors um, of varying ages and, and nothing, um, nothing but elaborate sets and costumes. So I think, uh, I think it actually that it would be a great sort of community piece to be done not just by arena theater, but something that integrated maybe a whole, a whole college in a certain way. It needs older people, it needs younger people, it needs a way to do that. So, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> Whenever that can happen. Another question? I have a question, a few, I'll just, I mean, I was just thinking about, I don't know her novels hardly at all, um, but in sort of, you know, reading her plays, I didn't know, it, it seems like a strange, you know, from the detective novel, to these religious plays and that are heavy. Mm -hmm. um, do you recognize any of a carryover in her voice in, in, in that? Yeah, I mean, well, a couple things. What's interesting is her first play was actually a detective play. <laughs> um, yeah, and true. so, you know, so she, she got her feet wet kind of in a way that, you know, and she did it with a close friend. And so right. it was kind of like, okay, let's try this out. Um, but when it comes to her religious plays, and I think, she too, I mean, she was a little surprised when Canterbury Cathedral came up and, you know, basically said, hey, want to write 
a play for this. I mean, because we're talking about the Canterbury Festival. That's um, what T.S. Eliot wrote Murder in the Cathedral for. Okay, so that's kind of the stature of this festival. Um, and, but she embraced it and I think was ready for it because particularly um, so many of her themes, I'm thinking particularly of her theme of um, the value of work but also the danger of pride in the work yeah. that appears in The Zeal of Thy House. I mean, she was preparing for that in her detective fiction. So yeah. definitely, um, you know, the themes come out. Um, I will say, you know, if you go back to the detective work looking, okay, where's that, where's that scene on the, the atonement? You know, you're, you're not going to find that there. <laughs> I mean, she was very much committed to, and she actually, um, several of her fans um, would write to her and say, you know, why isn't Lord Peter Whimsey a Christian? And she was just like, well, he's not, just get over it. <laughs> um, so she definitely saw the differences, but um, she did, I mean, one of the things I love about Sayers, but also one of the things that frustrates me is the same things just circulate over and over again, which means when you're doing a project on one thing, it's hard to narrow it down, because it's like, ooh, but I could also go here or here or here. Thank you so much. I um, am just wondering if I wanted to read more about Dorothy Sayers, especially this uh, focus on writing plays and theater, is there a book or an author that you would suggest um, to, to, to go to or to read? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. There's not a lot on her plays. Um, I would say probably Barbara Reynolds in The Passionate Intellect has the best discussion of um, The Just Vengeance in particular, and that's because it um, connects with Dante, and that's kind of Barbara Reynolds' overarching interest um, in um, the connection between Sayers and Dante. Um, so I think that's a really good discussion. Um, and other than that, there are little snippets here and there. Letters but and yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, in, um, yeah, if you go into the reading room, she's got great letters. We have great archives where you can read, mm -hmm. um, you know, just interactions between Sayers and um, the production team, there's fan mail, there's press clippings, so we've got great stuff, so. I think um, Sayers has this um, moment where she talks about um, but the work is true as kind of like her, this is what my life did. I, I made some work that, that I think is true, that it's good. And again, I, I'm really interested in the way you've gone back and forth between that side of her that says, well, what's the quality of the work on the other side, which is are you being prideful in that? And how does it do community? So I wonder if you could both talk about moments in your careers when you felt like you've done true work and how you think about your own work and how maybe a bit of how reading Sayers as we do think about your own work and when the work is true. Softball question. <laughs> I'm hoping you go first and <laughs> time runs out. I was hoping you would go first so I'd have time to think about you know, it. I, I think about this sometimes, I, I, you know, this is a random example in some ways, but you know, in the theater, we, we, build, we build to be torn down. So we build something, and it often looks good, and in three weeks, it's, it's gone. You know, we live in this idea that it's transient, and it goes away. And I think you can get stuck in thinking about that as you're building, right? So you can think, oh, who cares? It's going to be torn down in three weeks. Um, and I think, I think the best theater that I see, the, the craftsmen in theater that I respect, are who treat that work as honestly as, that, as something that would be there forever, right? It serves, it serves that thing so well, and even though that, that is actually gonna go away, the memory of it or the experience of the people who would see it and touch it and be part of it lives on forever. And that you have to serve that um, in your work, not just the idea that it's gonna be gone in three weeks. And I think that's difficult to navigate and something I struggle and you know, aspire to. Yeah, it's interesting as you're talking about kind of the transience of theater because I was thinking, you know, pride in my own work. Um, I actually feel like some of the best moments when I have pride are not 
when I get something published or when there's a lecture, but when I have an amazing class period, you know, and I leave the class going, oh, that was awesome, you know, <laughs> where like students got something or, or my favorite class periods are when students, um, you know, have an insight and I'm like, I never thought of that, you know, but it's there and it's gone. You know, and, and trying to recognize that there's also that continuity that goes across even those class periods that aren't brilliant, you know, and, and trying to build into that and kind of receive energy from that and not simply wait for those kind of great, great moments. And so kind of that's what was resonating with me, I think. I wonder if you could tie this in a little bit with <clears throat> what I understand was her efforts to work in working class churches, John Ren Lewis, the whole idea of community, which seems to be relevant to your presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, she definitely worked um, to kind of build dialogue in the community. Um, she worked with St. Anne's Church in Soho. Um, they hosted lectures and um, Though interestingly, I had originally thought that I would kind of talk a little bit about that and just kind of her, her work in that. Uh, but everything I discovered, um, and I didn't dig too deeply, but most of the things I discovered, were talking about how difficult it was. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the challenges of it and just keeping things going and people being too busy because they were trying to hold down two different jobs and trying to get things done. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I think that was something that she was, so one thing I love about Sayers is whatever she does, she throws herself into it, you know, and she was completely committed to doing that, but I think that was draining in a way that the theater wasn't, you know. I think she felt she got back a lot more in the theater, um, even though she did find those conversations worthwhile, um, you know, and particularly they were meant to be kind of um, a witness to the community to have the hard conversations, you know, with Christians and agnostics coming together to talk about great ideas. Um, but yeah, it seemed to be much more of a drain than kind of a life-giving situation, I think. Thank you so much. You talked about the influence of Charles Williams, is that right, in her life? I'd be interested in others who uh, were deeply influential in her faith. You know, what, what kind of Christian community did she have in terms of those like Charles Williams mm -hmm. and others who gave her encouragement, mm -hmm. uh, direction, uh, mm -hmm. guidance in her Christian faith? Yeah, I mean, Sayers, um, Sayers was great at com creating community around her. She was a wonderful letter writer, um, and so had wonderful connections with lots of different people. Um, I was just recently reading um, an exchange between her and um, James Welch, who was the director of religious broadcasting at the BBC, um, and lovely exchanges between them as they're, as they're grappling with these issues. In fact, um, I was reading the letter because there's a wonderful exchange, and I love the fact the exchange comes in the second footnote, or second, sorry, second um, postscript to this letter, you know, and so, um, and it was a lovely explanation of this idea of Christians bearing each other's burdens. And you could just see how she was kind of working that out, and she was actually responding to something. Um, it ends up in a postscript because she'd written the letter and then he had sent her something, um, and she wanted to respond to it, and she hadn't mailed the letter yet. And so she was like, oh wait, I wanna, you know, uh, comment on that. And so there was lovely give and take um, with that, um, with a number of people. Um, and then I do think that um, once she got involved with St. Anne's, there was also that element going on there as well. So yeah. Um, also, if you're interested, um, her letters uh, to Charles Williams are just lovely. Uh, they're all about Dante because she's like um, fangirling crush on Dante at this point. <laughs> um, but her letters are great because they are ridiculously long. You know, you can just see Charles Williams going, oh great, another 18 page letter from Dorothy <laughs> Sayers. Uh, <laughs> but that was her kind of exuberance and the kind of, you know, community that she was creating. Uh, 
uh, since we've circled back to Dante a couple, <coughs> excuse me, a couple times, I'm curious about Dante's vision of the donation of Constantine, sort of like the root of all the factional strife that he was experiencing, and how that squares with the presentation of Constantine you get in um, in, in Emperor Constantine, because it seems like the vision that Sayers that you presented with Sayers was pretty positive about you know, Constantine whipping the bishops into shape, mm -hmm. uh, or the you know, folks at, at Nicaea. And so I wonder, I mean, do, does the complexity emerge anywhere? Uh, and how does she handle that relationship? So if I knew Dante better? <laughs> um, so there is m more complexity there. But ultimately, um, she does represent Constantine as a fairly positive figure. I mean, he's, he is definitely kind of playing with Christianity as being kind of, ooh, this is working for me. You know, there's no real need for me to convert yet, kind of thing. And, you know, because when I convert, that means I actually have to change my life, which, you know, nobody wants to do that. Um, but ultimately, what I find interesting about the way that she creates um, Constantine is he is really interested and engaged, you know, and so um, he. He, he finally, the, he has to be kind of led to recognizing this, what's at stake, but once he does, he's fully engaged. So she does ultimately, I think, have a positive view of him. Can I just ask real quickly, how have these plays held up over time? We've had 75 to 80 years. Uh, obviously, we'd love to see it staged here in town somehow, but I'd love to get uh, you know, one of them staged anyway. I'd love to get a sense of uh, how they've sort of ebbed and flowed to the extent you know in terms of popularity, you know, in whatever context that is, whether it's Christian theater, whether it's secular theater, any sense of sort of how the plays have been received over time? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, interestingly, um, they got excellent reviews when they were first produced. Um, but I think what makes them challenging is they were produced in very particular circumstances. You know, we have the Canterbury Festival, or we have, you know, the um, anniversary of Litchfield Cathedral, and it was done, you know, in that setting. Um, and some of the plays then did actually transfer to London. Um, and got a production there. Um, but as far as kind of the longevity, there have been you know, productions that churches have put on, um, productions that the Sayers Society has done kind of at different, at different moments. Um, but they're really hard to do. Um, I mean, Emperor Constantine has, what, 85 roles or something? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so they're very difficult to do. Um, and they tend to be very, I mean, they're very um, dense. I think Just Vengeance in particular is very dense. And so it seems like in order to have a good production, you need something that's really kind of spectacular. You know, I mean, that was done in a cathedral, right? And so if you envision, you know, Christ carrying the cross up and down, you know, the aisles of the cathedral, that, that spectacle that, that contributes to that. Um, so yeah, definitely um, haven't been produced that often. And actually, as I mentioned, um, haven't really received a lot of scholarly attention either. Um, I'm wondering, the political context for Dorothy Sayers was the rise of the Third Reich and World War II. And I'm just wondering, you know, I know you talked about she focuses on individual sin and we're all sinful, but did she talk about systemic sin? How did she look at uh, World War II and the rise of the Third Reich in, in her own context? Mm -hmm. She did. Um, she wrote a, a tract called Begin Here, right at the beginning of the war. Um, and it's really in that she, that she talks um, about systemic sin, um, though granted, um, she has a disclaimer, she wrote it really quickly, and so it's a little chaotic. Um, but interestingly, she talks a lot, and some of this finds its way into the mind of the maker as well, but she talks about the fact that um, 
the idea of kind of the sin um, visiting upon subsequent generations and that kind of sin is based on the fact that it is breaking, in a sense, the rules of the universe. And so the idea that if you act in a certain way, it's going to have the consequences um, for generations and generations and generations. And so that was something that she felt like the war was actually a result of breaking away in certain ways from earlier. And so she sees the war as kind of a result of that um, and then begin here is basically her attempt to say, okay, this is the big warning. We've got to pull ourselves together and correct ourselves on all of these different ways so that we can stop that progression of the sin. I just want to hear from Andy. What, what do you think of the strengths and weaknesses of her as a playwright and of the play? Is that, how does it strike you as somebody who does theater? Um, I, I think at times they're heavy handed. Um, I think she's right, like, like you said, a very specific audience about a, clearly a very specific topic. Um, and, a, and a unique point in history where she's trying to bring, I think she's trying to bring a public who has a resonance of this still without a deep knowledge of doctrine back to these ideas that, that still feel like they're present for them. I don't know how that plays now. I, um, maybe in certain communities in a certain way. Um, that being said, there were things, she's also a very human playwright. She catches humanity in these, very, in these Bible stories and just vengeance that goes through the entire Cain and Abel. And I was moved by Eve, this character we don't know from the Bible. For her to give her voice and body and perspective in terms of her relationship with Adam, her relationship with her son being killed, and sort of how that sets us into sin was not, not heavy-handed, not placed in sort of symbolism, but really placed in that, in that human person that I had never read before and never encountered Eve in that way. So I, I think she's in this strange dichotomy where there's moments in it where I think, oh my goodness, it's so moving and there's other points I think an audience is going to go okay whoa you know whoa with the cross <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think it, it's got to be deftly handled um, wherever it's done wow thank you Andy and Christine and John. This was just a wonderful, wonderful evening and reminds me of some of the things that we've had in the past when Barbara Reynolds was here. Um, she was Dorothy Sayers' goddaughter. and uh, Christine mentioned her and in the late 1970s there was something on campus called the Sayers Festival. It was during that that Jim did Zealed the House and we have recordings of those, not video, but audio and a woman by the name of Kay Baxter, who was head of the Religious Drama Society in England, and others, James Brabazon from St. Anne, Soho. So you might enjoy those. There's also an exhibit in our museum right now on the Canterbury Festival. So you might, if you want to come back, you can look a little tonight, but you can come back at any other time. So, And there is a treasure trove, as both Andy and Christine Andy got a taste of it. Christine has lived in it for quite a while. So. <laughs> and there's so much here that you can listen to. And not, not only those recordings, um, but Man Born to Be King, her uh, radio uh, broadcast on the life of Christ, and just, just so many things. And uh, Laura, who's in the corner, and Elaine, um, who's not here tonight, will be good guides to let you in there. So please come back and enjoy it. And once again, um, it was a wonderful evening. Thank you both. And Thank you. See you.